And now it's time for questions and discussions. So can I ask the presenters to join us in the front? And uh, do we have microphones? Here, okay. So could I please ask those with questions to, to stand up, say your name, and, and speak in a microphone so everybody could hear. So any specific question? While you are, yes, please. Thank you Ross, for the question. Uh, yes, um, also I, I would like to highlight also that this, uh, this work is also the first time that we have a, uh, an epidemiology uh, comprehensive data set over the same similar core from under nine up to under 18. It's the first time. Often we have below under 13 or 14, or we have age group like from under 14, 16, 16. So we don't have any uh, uh, proper um, uh, feedback about this uh, question directly. No, by the, by the experience, the workload, he, of course, it's uh, uh, involved in, uh, in the, the overuse injuries and the apophysial injuries. And um, by, uh, uh, by dealing with, uh, with a young player, uh, to manage and monitor the load during the growth spurt, it's, by, uh, it's an important uh, consideration. Uh, any more questions? While you're thinking, I, I would like to ask uh, Marcus, um, um, hip problems as a reason for, for uh, groin pain it has become very popular, especially femur acetabular impingement. You showed that in the UEFA study it was 0.4% of all injuries. Uh, has it changed over the year? How is it today? Yeah, uh, you might correct me, but I think uh, if, you, if you're thinking of FAI, I think the, the figures are a little bit higher. It's about 1.5 now, but uh, it's not a very, very big issue in, in football, but it seems like there is a, a slow increase uh, in the use of FAI and, and hip pathology in the, uh, in the injury cards. So basically, I, I think we, we need to, to repeat the study from 2009, uh, including more seasons. But still only a minor part of uh, uh, groin uh, injuries. Uh, Andreas, you should... Uh, yeah, muscle is still the, the biggest one. Yeah. So Andreas, you, well, in your study, uh, it seems that muscle injury is the... the um, Muscle-related uh, entity is the biggest. We show that in the in the UEFA study as well. Uh, but in your study for acute injuries, you only had muscle injuries. Uh, is that uh, I mean, uh, when we speak about groin injuries, it's repeated like a mantra in all papers that there could be many reasons for groin pain. So we should be very wide in our differential diagnosis. Uh, Michel de Org uh, talked about that already in the beginning and it's written in all papers. But still, um, in your paper, you're only so muscle-related injuries. Yeah, so for, for me, there's a big difference in the acute onset and the long-standing groin pain. Uh, so the ones with acute onset are most likely more associated to the muscle tendon uh, unit. Um, but we do have uh, 22 to 25 percent of the uh, uh, of the injuries that we included here, which are imaging imaging negative, 
And with the imaging negative, we 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 only um, we only use we only look at the muscle, see if there's any edema, any any rupture, any tear. Um, so we have we have a subset of injuries that we haven't gone into a deeper analysis of, uh, which are the great zero injuries. Um, there could be different reasons for the pain. Uh, we don't have any reports of any labral tears, um, but it's um, it, that could be associated uh, with the pain as well. Um, we have maybe some bone marrow edema, uh, more unilateral, more extensive, maybe some underlying pathologies which are just exacerbated in, a, in an acute onset. Um, so there can be different reasons for the acute pain in, in the grade zero injuries. Uh, but clinically, uh, they look, as I, as I showed, um, more related to, to the muscle tendon unit. Okay. Questions? Yes, please. We have three questions here. Start with you in white shirt and tie. Yes, Hassan Sadri from Switzerland. Um, I'm also amazed um, in uh, Mr. Cerner's study 48% iliopsoas and rectus femoris lesions that are diagnosed but no um, imaging signs. May I suggest, uh, it is also a question, what imaging techniques you did use, you suggest ultrasound and MRI. Were they MR arthrograms? And in those MR arthrograms, did you do radial cuts? I'm asking you specifically that question because radial cuts are essential to diagnose labral tears. And labrum has very close relationship to iliopsoas and the reflected head of the rectus femoris. Usually when the reflected head of the rectus femoris is torn, the labral is also torn. There, there are some studies that, that shows this uh, association uh, between the labral tears and, and the rectus femoris uh, injuries. Um, for our study, we use eight different sequences of MRI. We don't use arthrograms, um, um, but, but the, the labral tears are considered as a diagnosis in, in the evaluation. So my point is probably in your iliopsoas and rectus femoris lesions, you are missing labral tears because you're not doing MR arthrograms with radial cuts. I insist on the radial cuts because otherwise the technique misses the labral tears. There, there could be a small risk that, that, we, uh, that we, we don't have uh, or we don't diagnose some of the labral tears. Um, in general, we have a pretty, uh, pretty standardized procedure for the, for the MRI sequences and very experienced radiologists giving these diagnoses. So if there's something that's suspected on, on the, M, uh, the MR sequences that we have, we, we always have a clinical approach first, so, so we're not only sticking to, to the research MRI, so, so the radiologist would then refer to an arthrogram if there's any uncertainties. And in, in none of these cases, that has been the, the incidence. And in your adductor lesions, I suppose you're using oblique sagittal uh, and sequencing. Actual. And actual. Right, so that's why you're picking up those adductor tests so well. I, I think just to, to comment on the, on the, on the differential uh, diagnosis, a, a lot of the, the discrepancy that we find here is, is I don't think it's related to the label tears. I think it's related to, to the, uh, uh, the presentations of symptoms in the players. So you have a player coming in with, uh, uh, with, an, with an acute groin injury, and the injury is in the rectus femoris. Um, there's swelling, there's pain, there's a lot. They come in right after the injury. So, so there's a, they're, they're sometimes very painful. So in the clinical setting, it can be hard to differentiate these diagnoses. And sometimes they even give two diagnoses. So we say, okay, the doctor says this is probably a uh, uh, rectus femoris tear, uh, a second diagnosis, iliosolus tear. Um, in, in, the, in the MRI or the ultrasound afterwards, we'll only find one of these possibly, and that why that's, the other one will come up as a discrepancy in this one. Um, and so, so a lot of the, the, um, the, the discrepancy can, can, in my opinion, be explained by the, the, the presentation from the athlete. Yeah, um, 
Bill, Bill Myers, uh, Philadelphia. The, uh, I enjoyed the presentations very much, and uh, I was just uh, going to ask a question directed primarily at uh, uh, John and Marcus from the standpoint of epidemiology. The, uh, we've been seeing quite a difference in the types and patterns and of injuries in, from sport to sport and even within positions within sports. Like baseball is probably one of the most practiced uh, position, uh, types of sports in terms of position to position and in terms of a third baseman versus a pitcher and versus a catcher. Uh, just wondering what you've observed in terms of your, in terms of patterns of injury uh, and, you know, throughout the whole core in terms of the, all the muscles and including the hip. Just uh, can, could you make any comments about that in terms from your data? Yeah, thanks. Um, I did have some data on that in the um, systematic review that obviously for time reasons I didn't include. But um, there are, um, of the sports, and I'll try to remember all the ones that, are, that we looked at, in, in rugby union there was a higher rate in backs than forwards for groin injuries. Um, in ice hockey there was a higher rate in goaltenders than other players. In... Um, American football is higher rated in special teams than in offence and defence. And um, baseball, I don't think that... Um, I'm just trying to remember that whether, whether there was a pitchers versus position players. I think that there um, were differences reported, but I'm not sure. I can't, I'd have to go back and look to my, look to my data. Do, do, you want to, do you want to tip me off on which one's going to be higher out of, out of pitches well, and position players? I we, think it's we've been seeing strikingly different uh, yep. patterns. And, uh, you know, for example, basketball players will get a much more pronounced, just like runners, osteitis associated with the, the uh, presum presumptively associated with the pounding, et cetera. Uh, different types of dancers. We've seen, different, uh, we've seen difference in the patterns. Uh, Quadus lumbarum injuries and Scottish Highland dancers versus Irish step dancers, which is interesting. Uh, but, you know, you can actually define uh, specific types of injuries that are, uh, uh, that are specific to, not totally specific to the sport, but heterodominance of certain sports over other ones. Yeah. yeah. I just remember one extra too from the sport that I'm working in. I shouldn't forget it. But there's in cricket bowlers get more than, or fast bowlers get more than batsmen and spin bowlers. So, um, but, yeah, it's an, it's, it's an area that hasn't got, it's even even less complete in terms of good quality data, but there are some trends that, are, that I'll report in the discussion of that um, <coughs> um, systematic review. John, I have... Um, uh, you, you pointed out something that I think is very important, that it's important not to compare apples with oranges. And uh, because in your, in your presentation, you said, for example, the NHL ice hockey had incidents of groin injuries between 17 and 23.5 per thousand hours of exposure. That's as much as the total injuries in elite soccer. Uh, it's, it's, it's obvious that, you're, that it's not comparing uh, the same thing. Football has done a good thing by, by all the federations have sit together, work together consensus of a recommendation how studies should be done, how injuries should be defined, and, and how data should be collected. Isn't that something that should be spread to other sports as well? You know, I agree with that. There's, um, and other sports are slowly doing it. So um, in uh, roughly 10 years ago, um, football, rugby union and <coughs> cricket had consensus definitions and then... Um, a few other sports have added them since, but then we maybe need to have um, a consensus definitions between sports because if, if each individual sport wants to have a different consensus definition, then, um, then um, it's hard to then compare between sports. So I in the review that I performed, I only did statistical calculations between groups when it was comparing apples with apples. So I, I, I didn't want to say as a conclusion the highest rate is ice hockey because it looks that way, but it may be because they're including every single incident of a sore groin versus you know, some of the other codes are looking just at match time loss, just at training time loss. And, and, and it could, the, the difference or the, the, the apparent higher rate in ice hockey could be entirely due to those studies having a much broader definition of what an injury is than, um, than the true incidents being that much higher. Yes, Michelle. 
I have two epidemiological questions to Marcus. The first one is that I can imagine as uh, adductor lesions are mostly consequent to kicking or to changing of direction, that there is a greater frequency of such lesions in the leg that is the favorite leg of the football player. Do you have statistics about that compared to the other leg? And my second question is, I have always learned that technical, uh, skillful players uh, are more ready for adductor injuries than players who are not skillful because when they hit the ball, they do it with more adduction of the hip than a guy who is just uh, hitting straight in front. So is it not better to be not too skillful if you want to avoid adductor lesions? Like you and me, you mean? <laughs> exactly, thank you. <laughs> I have no answer uh, to the second question. Uh, it's very difficult to, to do a cutoff between sk uh, skilled players and, and less skilled players. We are not done that analysis. But I think you're, you're right. That it's more adductor-related injuries on the dominant side in contrast to hamstring injuries where we see a 50-50. Yes, but I, I don't remember the exact uh, figures, but, but it is more common. But in hamstring injuries, it's 50-50, yeah. Can I take yeah, because we have it in, in our study, and we record whether uh, the dominant or the non-dominant leg is, is injured. And there's a little bit higher amount of injuries in the dominant leg, but it, it's, not, uh, it's not a big difference. I think it's around 60 to 40 or, or, or even lower. But if you look at the kicking injuries, 90%, uh, 95% of the kick, kicking injuries are in the, in the dominant leg. So... There's a question in the back yeah. row. Hi, Arca Sargent from Madrid. Actually, hang on to the microphone, Andreas. The question is regarding um, the cases where there was a discrepancy between the clinical diagnosis and the imaging findings. It was about a third when the clinical was iliopsoas or rectus femoris was a suspicion. Could you um, expand a bit on what injuries were seen on imaging in those cases specifically? Yeah, so usually when, when you have a clinical presentation and, and, and it's reported as, a, as an iliopsoas injury, um, it, it can, the, the discrepancy is, is often um, towards either the sartorius injury, but most commonly a rectus femoris injury, and the other way around. So the rectus femoris injuries that are diagnosed in clinic uh, are, are, are sometimes uh, diagnosed as iliopsoas injuries uh, in, in the ultrasound or the MRI. So those, those are the main two. So it's usually an interchange between those two? Yeah. Not yeah. a it's, third it's, diagnosis? It's, it's rarely. Sometimes we also see that some of the, the diagnosis of the illusoas are, are down in, in, uh, in the, the adductors, but mainly uh, these two because they're so adjacent. And, and a lot of the times the fluid uh, that, that comes out is, is located right in between uh, the two muscle, muscles. Thank you. So probably like causing the pain there. Uh, Sorry, I think we uh, need to keep the time, and uh, I would like to thank the audience for many interesting questions, and above all, the presenters for a very good presentation. Thank you very much.